Plato once wrote of his fellow Greeks that they lived around the Mediterranean like frogs around a pond. This was due in large part to the colonization efforts which were made by the various Greek polis of the Greek mainland during the Archaic period. However, no polis contributed more to this period of colonization than Corinth, which seems to have established nearly half of all of the Greek colonies around the Mediterranean. How did Corinth pull this off, and why was Corinth known as Wealthy Corinth? In this video, I hope to answer that question. I will be focusing heavily on Corinth's history during the Archaic and Classical period, with occasional forays into other subjects as well. So, let us learn together about the history of Corinth, the masters of trade and colonization of the ancient Greek world. Much of Corinth's success, and later some of its struggles against its neighbors, stemmed from its geography. Corinth is located in the literal middle of the Greek world. It is located on the south end of the Isthmus of Corinth, which separates central Greece, that is the Greece of Boeotia and Athens, from the Greece of the Peloponnese, that being dominated by Argos and Sparta. Corinth, therefore, would be in the middle of all of the trade in the Greek world, but also of all of the invasion forces. It also has two ports. We'll talk about those in more detail momentarily. Those would be much more useful and much more of a positive good than its land connections. One quick note about Corinth. The modern site of Corinth is actually located at the ancient site of the Corinthian port of Lycaon. The site of ancient Corinth is actually farther inland and was abandoned after an earthquake in 1858. The locals decided that the coast would be a much more profitable region as it would enable easier trade access. There were a number of canal efforts that were attempted in antiquity by both Corinthian rulers and later by Rome. All of these failed for various reasons. The modern effort technically succeeded, but is not wide enough in order to facilitate actual trade or the movement of cargo ships. It is, however, useful for tourists visiting modern Greece. Most Greek polis would count themselves lucky if they had one decent natural harbor. Athens to the north was lucky insofar as it had two very good harbors at Phalaren and at the Piraeus. However, both of those harbors opened up into the Saronic Gulf, so both of them effectively served the same purpose in terms of trade and accessibility. Corinth was arguably much more blessed than Athens because it had two harbors, each of which opened up into a different body of water. Lycaon is Corinth's port to the west into the Gulf of Corinth. This leads into the Ionian Sea and thence to Italy thus giving Corinth a pretty good command of trade to the west. Lycaon was probably the more important of the two ports, and since it was closer to Corinth proper, the Corinthians decided to build long walls to connect Lycaon with Corinth by about 400 BCE. No doubt they got this idea from the Athenians who built comparable long walls to connect Athens with the Piraeus. As for Kinshire, this is Corinth's port to the east, which opens onto the Saronic Gulf and thence to the Aegean Sea. Corinth's control of these two natural harbors gave it an advantage in both trade and colonization. Corinth had a hand in each side of Greece and therefore had trade with both Anatolia and with Italy and Sicily. So Corinth in the Archaic period, due to this early advantage, was doing the greatest trade volume, and it should come as no surprise that Corinth what became the greatest colonizing factor in the Greek world. Perhaps the most striking geographical feature of the Isthmus of Corinth is the Acro Corinth. This is the mountainous citadel of ancient Corinth. And of all of the various Acropolis in the Greek world, this one is almost certainly the most imposing. Of course, the Athenian Acropolis is the most iconic due to the Parthenon, but it is not nearly so imposing as a fortress when compared with the Acro Corinth. Unfortunately, the Acro Corinth has changed hands many times, and its defensive value has not been lost on the successive uh, 
occupants of the isthmus. Due to that, there have been a lot of different structures on the Acro Corinth, and this makes reconstructing what was there in antiquity rather difficult. Pausanias, who wrote in the 2nd or 3rd century CE, says that the patron deity in his time was Artemis. There was a temple there for Artemis. However, this temple would have been built by the Romans and didn't necessarily reflect what was there originally. Now, typically the Romans did tend to be somewhat conservative on all matters religious, but they could, from time to time, deviate from that pattern. It is more likely that the site was dedicated to the god Poseidon during the Archaic and Classical periods, but it's also possible, given that Corinth was also famous for having a temple of Apollo, that the site was sacred to the god Apollo. Unfortunately, we don't know. Earlier, I mentioned that the major neighbors of Corinth were Argos, Athens, Thebes, and Sparta. However, much nearer to hand were other smaller powers, which were somewhat under the sway of Corinth. One nearby neighbor was the city of Tinea. There was also Sicyon, which was just to the west along the Gulf of Corinth. Megara was on the northern end of the isthmus and was kind of wedged between the influence of Corinth on the one hand and Athens on the other. The nearest major polis would have been Athens to the northeast and then Argos to the south. Sparta and Thebes were considerably further away, but still close enough to be a major influence. For the Greeks, their mythological predecessors were quite important in how they thought of themselves and presented themselves to others. In international diplomacy, it was standard for envoys to speak of the ancient, to the Greeks this meant what we would call the Mycenaean period, history of their polis and all of the great things that they had accomplished. They would mention what they had been doing in the age of Heracles, for instance. For Corinth, this was a bit of a weak point since they did not have a very big role in Greek mythology. And even the claims that the Corinthians advanced about themselves from this period were often disputed by their neighbors, who said the Corinthians didn't have their facts straight about who had founded them or who had come from this area and settled elsewhere. As for the physical remains from the Mycenaean period, we do see that the Mycenaeans indeed had a presence on the isthmus, just as one would expect given that they had a presence to the north and south of this area. Corinthian sites, however, were rather unimpressive for this period. Corinth itself was a pretty minor site, despite being the home of the Acro Corinth, one of the greatest natural um, fortresses of the Greek world. If anything, the major site in the Mycenaean era would have been the port of Lechian on the Gulf of Corinth. However, this is not to say that our archaeological picture of the Mycenaean period is by any means complete, and as I mentioned earlier about the Acro Corinth, the degree to which the evidence has been preserved is somewhat limited due to all of the constant construction and reconstruction on the site. So perhaps there was a more major settlement there than we're aware of, but so far as we can tell at this juncture, the only real settlement in the Mycenaean period, at least the only one with any significant size, was at Lechian. As was frequently the case in the Greek world, the Corinthians had a tradition that they had originally been under a monarchy, and then this monarchy had given way to an aristocracy. In their case, however, this did not mean that rule changed family hands, just that it spread to a larger group. Allow me to explain. The Bacchia dynasty seems to have ruled Corinth perhaps as early as the Dark Ages, and certainly by the dawn of the Archaic around 800 BCE. Eventually, though, this family grew out to include hundreds of adult men, perhaps as many as 200, and they decided that the rule of the Bacchians should not be limited to merely one person, but instead should be spread about the entire family. Hence, the Bacchia dynasty fell to the Bacchia die. The Bacchia die just being the collective term for all of the men who composed this larger family. This ended up becoming sort of a corporate family rule as opposed to a narrow monarchy. 
and for all practical intents and purposes, this was an aristocracy, but rather than being all of the noble families, this was merely one big extended family with multiple branches. The Bacchiadae claimed descent and hence their nobility from Heracles, one of the key figures in Dorian mythology. Heracles was big in the mythology of all Greeks, but none more so than the Dorians. The family practiced intermarriage, also known as endogamy, in order to avoid dispersing or sharing power with others. Whether this affected them genetically or not is hard to say, but let's face it, the answer is probably so. The Bacchidae controlled Corinth from 747 until 657 BCE. The tradition is that Corinth was sort of stuck in the mud until the rise of the Bacchidae, and then it began to grow by leaps and bounds and become one of the major powers in the Greek world. This may be the case, however it is worth noting that it was in the middle of the 8th century, exactly the time when the Bacchidae came to power, when the Greek world really began to expand and show signs of fluorescence. As I mentioned earlier, perhaps the most important thing that Corinth did in the course of its history was to engage in colonization on a mammoth scale. Its first colony was also its most important and successful, that would be the city of Syracuse in Sicily, founded around 734-733. Syracuse went on to become the most powerful and important Greek polis in the West. Just a little bit later, Corinthian settlers also conquered and resettled Kerkyra, modern Corfu, sometimes also called Corsaira, in the 730s. A bit later, down into the 7th century now, the Corinthians founded Apollonia and Illyria in order to spread Greek culture to the Northwest Balkans, and then as late as 627 they founded Epidamnus, the site of the later Roman port of Dyrrhachium. Another city they founded in the 7th century was the city of Potidaea in the Chersonese, and the purpose here was to spread Greek culture in the Thrace and also gain access to the timber and gold resources of the Thracian region. One of the more controversial topics in archaic Greek studies is the issue of tyranny. Unlike in the modern world where tyranny has some very negative connotations, in the Greek world a tyrant was simply someone who brought order and someone who ruled in his own name as a single person without quite being a monarch. It used to be thought that a tyrant was someone who represented the people against the aristocracy, but we now think that since all of the tyrants hailed from the aristocracy themselves, that it is more plausible to see them as champions of a balance between the aristocracy and the people. This would be a tyrant who had the support of most of his fellow aristocrats and also some popular support, so he would kind of bring some sort of semblance of balance and prevent some of the worst excesses of the aristocracy while not really giving the people all that much. Kipsilus was the first tyrant of Corinth. He was elected Polemarch in 657. This means that he was one of the Bacchidae himself, but because he was in charge of the Corinthian military, he was able to mount what amounted to a coup and take control as tyrant. Kipsilus would then rule for another 30 years until his death in 627, and he would found a successful line of, of um, tyrants called the Kipsilids. He was able to make peace with his various cousins, the Bacchidae, by sending some of them off as colonists to Apollonia and Epidamnos. It's also worth noting here that, so far as we're aware, most colonization efforts were not due to overpopulation or anything of that nature. In fact, the Greek world would not really develop marginal farmland until the 4th century when population pressure forced them to do so, but rather due to political conflict. Rather than fighting it out over existing land and um, urban centers, usually Greek elites, when they came into conflict with their neighbors, would offer to leave in exchange for peace, and then their political opponents would help them fund and organize these expeditions. One of the um, usual terms of the colonists who would set out is that they would take an oath to the people remaining behind that they would never return. 
colonization was largely a way to deal with civil disorder. And this is an example under Kipsilis when he sends out colonists to go to um, Apollonian Epidomnos. Kipsilis was succeeded as tyrant by his son and heir Periander, who ruled in his own right from 627 to 585. Periander is perhaps the greatest Corinthian to ever live, and he is perhaps the person most responsible for turning Corinth into wealthy Corinth. He was a great state builder. He established tolls for both sea and overland trade. This revenue seems to have been one of the earliest and most sophisticated systems of revenue collection in the Greek world up to that time. He developed, or someone under him perhaps, developed the Dialco system. This was a method for moving ships over land across the Isthmus to avoid the need to sail around the Peloponnese. This would save time and money for ship captains who were trying to get their cargo from the Gulf of Corinth into the Saronic Gulf or vice versa. And it also allowed the Corinthians to charge money for their services in transporting these ships and goods over land. So it was kind of a win-win, and this would also become a major source of economic um, income for the Corinthians. During the period of Periander, and for perhaps 50 or so years after his death, maybe only 40, Corinthian-style pottery was at its most dominant. We'll see that most Greeks were copying Corinthian styles, including the Athenians, and that it was at Corinth where it seems that the heart of Greek artisanship and intellectual activity was located, at least until perhaps about the mid-6th century, when things began to shift elsewhere. Earlier I mentioned that tyranny was neither seen as good nor bad, merely as being a form of government. For the most part, the tyrants were remembered in an ambivalent way, and there certainly is a negative tradition about Periander. Some sources talk about his tyrannical rule and some of his acts of cruelty. However, the dominant tradition about Periander is that he was one of the wisest and most accomplished statesmen to ever live. In fact, he was considered so accomplished that in many of the list of the seven sages of Greece, Periander is included. In fact, on most of them, he is named. We know that just like Solon of Athens, Periander wrote a fair amount of poetry about his political ideas. That being said, there are no surviving fragments of Periander's writing. However, there were ancient sources who had read what Periander had to say, and they were duly impressed with his prescience. Periander also gained some reputation for wisdom by being a patron of both poets and early philosophers. This was a way for rich people to buy their way into the halls of wisdom, and certainly Periander spent his fair amount of money to get that distinction. One of Corinth's greatest monuments was built around 560 or so BCE. This was the Temple of Apollo, located not far from the Acro Corinth, and built of 42 pillars of local limestone. In the Archaic period and well into the Classical period, one of the ways that the polis would compete with one another was to innovate in their temple designs and build something better and bigger than what their neighbors had produced up to that point. By building the Temple of Apollo when they did, Corinth took the lead in the temple building competition, and for a time, this temple was one of the great sights to see in ancient Greece. It was easily one of the most impressive and advanced of the archaic temples. However, we no longer have a very clear picture of what this would have looked like in its prime due to heavy alterations made during the Roman, Byzantine, they added some Christian stuff, and Ottoman periods, they tried to make it more of a mosque-like structure. And we only have seven original pillars left standing. Even the Romans, who tended to be rather conservative in their religious um, alterations to things, added a small cult of the emperor to this temple. The seven pillars that we do have, however, represent some of the very limited remains of surviving archaic temple structure. 
So much of what we know about archaic temple building from the 6th century comes from this very site. Hopefully this will continue to be preserved for years to come. Periander's tyranny represented perhaps the peak of Corinth as a power vis-a-vis -vis its various rivals in Greece. However, Corinth in the Archaic period continued to make strides. In 581, Corinth founded the Isthmian Games. These games were similar to the Nemean Games, the Great Panathenaea, and of course the Olympics in that it featured various athletic contests. These games would continue all the way until the late Roman Empire. In 570, Corinth created its first coinage. This coinage featured a Pegasus, and the Pegasus quickly became the symbol of Corinthian power and prosperity. During the 4th century, in the wake of the Athenian failed attempt to conquer Sicily, most of the Greek cities of Magna Graecia also adopted the Pegasus, as a kind of middle finger to the Athenians. Of course, this also favored Syracuse, which could claim its Corinthian heritage and also advertise itself and its descent from the Corinthians. By 560 or 50, as we noted earlier, the Temple of Apollo was constructed, and this was the greatest monument the Corinthians were able to produce. In 550, Corinth aligned itself with Sparta against Argos and others. Elis, Corinth, and Sparta thus formed a kind of triumvirate, and the Peloponnesian League developed from there. In 525, Argos tried to challenge Sparta for dominance in the Greek world, at least in the Peloponnese, and the Corinthians played a major role in helping Sparta to secure the victory and retain its hegemony. In 519, we see that Corinth remained very prestigious on the international scene, as the Athenians and Thebans turned to Corinth to settle a dispute between themselves. Athens and Thebes were often at each other's throats, and the fact they turned to Corinth rather than to Sparta suggests that Corinth was seen as prestigious enough to mediate in this affair. Sadly, however, for the Corinthians, the later 6th century was not just a time of progress, but also a time of Corinth slowly being overshadowed by its neighbor to the northeast, Athens. Over the course of the Archaic period, Corinth would find itself overtaken in terms of its trade volume and its artisanal dominance. The Athenians would be producing more and, frankly, more innovative pottery. By the last quarter of the 6th century, Corinth went from being the place where innovations were made to being the place where they would just more or less imitate what the Athenians had done a decade before. Around the same time, we see that pottery remains at various sites throughout the Mediterranean will feature increasingly more Athenian and less Corinthian fragments. Although Corinth was now more or less subordinate to Sparta politically and had fallen behind Athens economically and culturally, we should not underestimate Corinth's standing in the Greek world. Within the Peloponnesian League, where Sparta allowed most of its allies to have a big voice in what went down, Corinth was easily the most valued of Sparta's many allies. A large part of this was due to the fact that Sparta had no fleet of its own, and most of its members didn't either. Corinth more or less provided the entirety of the Peloponnesian fleet save a handful of ships here or there. During the Persian War, while Athens and Sparta rightly reaped the majority of the credit, Corinth was a valued ally. In fact, it pr produced about the second most triremes of any Greek polis on the Greek side. The Corinthians manned around 40 triremes during the Persian War. Um, this was second only to Athens, which had around 180, and while that is a distant second, it is still comfortably above any of the other Greek powers. Agina was able to produce 30 triremes for the war, and everyone else was only fielding a handful. By 430 or so, Corinth had perhaps 150 triremes and was second only to the Athenians in naval strength. And again, this was a big gap. By 430, Athens had around 300 triremes, 
Still, though, Corinth was the only power which could even dream of challenging Athenian naval dominance. Typically speaking, the way that people present and understand the Peloponnesian War is as a rivalry between Athens and Sparta. And while on its face this is true, the origins of the war really boil down to a conflict between Athens and Corinth. If we look at the build-up conflicts which led to the Peloponnesian War, both of them involve Athens and Corinth butting heads at sea. Corinth had serious beef with Kerkyra, its colony in the west, which was trying to claim hegemony over former Corinthian colonies in what was then called Illyria, places like Apollonia and Epidamnos. Corinth and Kerkyra had a major naval battle. By this time, Kerkyra had the third greatest fleet in Greece of around 110 triremes. The Athenians sent a mere 10 ships, but these ships helped to turn the tide in the favor of the Kerkyrians, who emerged victorious from the Battle of Cybota. Corinth was deeply enraged by Athenian interference in what they regarded as their own affairs. Now granted, its colonies in the West and elsewhere were independent, but Corinth had a much closer relationship with those colonies, both commercial and otherwise, than most cities had with their colonies. Corinth was so enraged by Athenian aggression that when they met with the other Peloponnesian League powers, they threatened to Sparta that they would secede from the League unless Sparta declared war on Athens and made good their losses. Accordingly, one of the earliest Athenian actions once the war broke out was to lay siege to the Corinthian colony of Potidaea, one of the few cities facing the Aegean which wasn't already under Athenian control. The Corinthians tried their best to relieve the siege but failed, and the Athenians, despite an outbreak of plague in the camp, were able to take the city and thus further their control of the Chersonese. The war, once it broke out, of course, would boil down to Athens versus Sparta, but Corinth would continue to contribute much of the Spartan fleet and also a good number of hoplites every time the Spartans would invade Athens' home territory of Attica. Corinth, as part of the Peloponnesian League, should have been satisfied with the results of the Peloponnesian War. Athens lost around half its population in the course of the war, and it was defeated, its long walls destroyed. However, Sparta decided that despite the pleas of Corinth and Thebes to destroy Athens completely and enslave the surviving population, that it would be wiser to leave Athens up as a foil in order to ensure the continued fear and therefore loyalty of Corinth and Thebes. The Corinthians and Thebans always bore a grudge about this because they had been trying to get rid of Athens for a long time and they felt that their own histories had been worsened by the actions of the Athenians. Lysander did install a friendly regime at Athens called the Thirty Tyrants and the Thirty unfortunately for them squandered their opportunity to rule in peace with the support of their oligarchic neighbors by rounding up and killing democratic opponents. This led to a democratic counter-revolution, and in order to try to stop this, the general Lysander intervened. However, since Lysander had amassed too much prestige for the Spartans at home to feel comfortable, King Pausanias marched in and intervened, allowing democracy to return in 403. This further enraged the opinion of Corinth and, Athen, uh, Corinth and Thebes. Not only had Sparta failed to remove Athens from the map as they had wanted, but now the Athenian ancestral constitution, which had brought them so much grief over the last century plus, had returned. Athens would eventually recover and once again may prove to be a major pain in the side of both the Corinthians and the Thebans. This meant that Corinth no longer felt that it could trust Sparta to look out for its best interest that Sparta was only interested in what was best for Sparta. This went against what Sparta had done in the past when it had been known as a just hegemon of the Peloponnesian League. Another disturbing sign of Spartan intentions was the way that it was treating the minor Greek polis across what had been the Athenian Empire. Whereas the Spartans promised that they would liberate the Greeks from tyranny, 
They instead imposed what were known as decarchies, narrow oligarchies of 10 very pro-Spartan, very conservative oligarchs in each of the small cities and islands of the Aegean. This worried the Corinthians, who knew that if the Spartans were willing to engage in this level of tyranny, they would not hesitate to impose a coup on the Thebans or the Corinthians if they thought it would be convenient for Spartan interest. Corinth and Thebes therefore began to plot amongst themselves in order to free themselves from the influence of Sparta, which was becoming an even worse tyranny than Athens had been during its peak 30 years before. Scholars estimate that around this time, around the year 400, right after the war, Corinth would have had around 90,000 residents. This would have been about the peak of its population, give or take a little bit. By contrast, Athens at its peak around 431, right as the war was breaking out, would have had anywhere from 250 to 300,000 residents throughout Attica. So Corinth at its best was maybe a third as populous and powerful as Athens, and that really makes a lot of sense. However, keep in mind that around 400, Athens was at around half strength. So Corinth and Athens would have been fairly comparable, just with Corinth having more money available and having its fleet and fortifications in much better condition. In the early 390s, King Agesilaus of Sparta invaded the Persian-held territories of western Anatolia. Here, there were Greek cities which had formerly been part of the Athenian Empire. Before that, they belonged to Persia. Agesilaus' claim is that since Sparta had defeated Athens, these lands were now the property of the Spartan hegemony. Persia naturally disagreed. This led to a protracted conflict in western Anatolia. Back in Greece, Corinth and Thebes were becoming increasingly tired of Spartan arrogance, and they were looking for an opportunity. Finally, Persia was tired of having Agesilaus at its doorstep, so it began to offer gold to any Greeks who were willing to revolt against Sparta's rule at home. Corinth and Thebes signed up for this gravy train and then entered into a revolt. They were able to secure the allegiance of Athens and Argos, two other major players, and this created an alliance strong enough to pose an existential threat to a Sparta with a large percentage of its army away in Asia Minor. Agesilaus was then forced to make peace with Sparta, or make peace with Persia, abandon all of Anatolia to the Persians, and march home. Despite the best efforts of the allies to block Agesilaus' return, he was able to get back to the Peloponnese, and Sparta ultimately did prevail in the war, although it was only when they were able to, for their part, win the support of Persia and get its gold flowing into their coffers rather than the coffers of their enemies. It wasn't hard to convince Persia, by the way, because one of the key members of that alliance that I mentioned was Athens, a long-standing enemy of Persia. This war had posed a great enough threat that Sparta had to really weaken its ambitions. It lost its fleet, and this meant that it would be focused more close to home. Most of the war took place on the Isthmus of Corinth, and here is where the majority of the damage from the war was inflicted. If you had to count the winners and losers of the war once it ended in 387 with the Peace of Antalcidas, Sparta sort of broke even. It maintained its hegemony, but with some significant losses. Athens more or less won because it had got money from Persia in order to refound its fleet and rebuild its fortifications. Persia was the big winner. It got the most out of the war and it also weakened and divided the Greeks. Corinth was also among the losers here because its attempt to break away from Sparta more or less failed and it was forced back into the Spartan orbit, at least for the time being. For the remainder of the fourth century, that is to say the remainder of the classical period, Corinth was more or less politically irrelevant, so we won't bother to talk about any more political events there. One thing that is interesting from a cultural perspective, however, is that there was something of a cult around a famous prostitute in Corinth. During the Peloponnesian War, the Athenians had launched two expeditions to Sicily, the first of which is often forgotten but occurred in 424 under the general Nicias, who of course later commanded the failed expedition in 415. 
At any rate, the Athenians had taken some captives during that foray and then sold these captives to enslaved markets across Greece in order to raise money. One of the slaves that they took during this first entry into Sicily was a Greek courtesan named Laius. Laius was then sold in Corinth and became a local celebrity and obsession because she was said to be the most beautiful courtesan of her day and by a long shot. Men would be willing to pay all kinds of money to have a chance at Laius. This meant that she was almost worshipped as a kind of hero or demigod, and her grave became a local site. She was something like a Marilyn Monroe type figure. In Pausanias' time, her grave was still a local landmark. This would be hundreds of years later. If we think about what a lot of the Greek moralists thought of port towns, the fact that there was more or less a hero shrine to a prostitute more or less confirmed the conservative attitudes about port towns being dens of sin and degeneracy. However, um, Laius, of course, as a courtesan, would have been quite cultured and most likely was very refined. So when we think of her as a prostitute, we have to realize that courtesans, the Greek word being hetaira, these women were very much accomplished poets. They could speak about philosophy knowledgeably, and they were known as much for their companionship as for their strictly sexual abilities. So um, I think it's safe to say Laius is one of the most important and influential of all courtesans in Greek history, second only to a couple of the courtesans in Athenian history who were better recorded by virtue of living in a city which wrote more stuff down. The Acro Corinth took on a dark significance during the late classical and early Hellenistic period. Starting with Philip II and continued by his son Alexander the Great, then by the Antipatrids and Antigonids of Macedon, the Acro Corinth became one of the key fortresses in Greece used to retain Macedonian control. It housed a significant Macedonian garrison, and more so than any of the other so called fetters of Greece, the Acro Corinth was the linchpin of Macedonian control over the Greeks of the south. This was a dark period for Corinth, and until the middle of the third century, Corinth was more or less simply stuck in the orbit of Macedon. So for about a hundred years from the Battle of Chironea in 338 down to 243, Corinth was little more than a satellite campus of Macedonian power. Over the course of the 3rd century, many of the other Greeks had not taken Macedonian dominance lying down, and they had formed up into two different leagues which helped to challenge Macedonian dominance. The Aetolian and Achaean leagues collectively would pool their resources and field armies which were able to hold their own with the armies of the Antigonids. In 243, one such army under Aridus of Sicyon, a man from a neighboring city, was able to capture the Acro Corinth and then convince the Corinthians to join the Achaean League. Since the Achaean League ostensibly promoted democracy in a very moderate form, quite unlike classical Athenian democracy, this means that perhaps for the first time in its history, Corinth was under a democratic government after 243. Over the following decades, due to its commercial significance, Corinth became the de facto capital of the Achaean League. The Achaean League, by and large, was gaining on its adversaries, and it made a wise decision about 20 or 30 years after the fall of the Acro Corinth to align itself with the new power in the area, Rome. However, the de facto shift in capitals to Corinth and this alliance with Rome would one day pay dividends of a distinctly dark variety. For around 80 years or so, the Achaean League had been a loyal ally of Rome, helping it out in a number of conflicts against the Aetolian League, Sparta, and the Macedonians. It had been dormant for a while, and while it remained an independent power, it more or less accepted its role as a subordinate of Rome. It knew where its bread was buttered, and it knew which power was dominant in the Greek world. 
However, the Achaean League was insistent upon keeping up its own power and form. Many members of the Achaean League, however, did not quite feel the same way. They thought the League was now obsolete. Rome was keeping the peace in Greece, and there was no reason for them to continue contributing men and money to a League which no longer had an enemy. So, when members began to secede, the Achaean League authorities tried to move to suppress them with military force. Rome, for its part, refused to allow this and threatened war if the Achaean League tried to keep itself together. For whatever reason, the Achaean League thought that Rome was bluffing and that surely they would not be so unreasonable as to try to intervene in the internal affairs of an ally. So the Achaean League kept trying to keep its members in line, and even after only mild moves against its former allies, Rome decided to declare war against the Achaean League, claiming that the Achaeans were harboring aggressive intentions toward Rome itself. The Romans therefore sent a massive army under the consul Lucius Mummius. Corinth immediately offered to surrender. It knew that neither the Achaean army nor the defenses of Corinth were sufficient to hold off Mummius. And while Mummius himself may have been inclined to accept the surrender rather than undergoing a potentially costly assault, he was ordered by the Senate explicitly to make sure to capture and destroy the city of Corinth. He followed his orders, and in 146 BCE, the same year that the Romans brutally sacked Carthage, they also inflicted a brutal sack upon the city of Corinth. The historian Polybius gives us the distinct impression that Mummius was none too pleased with his orders, and he allowed many Corinthians to flee the city before his army arrived. When he sacked the city, he didn't end up killing or enslaving as many people as one would expect. So many Corinthians survived and presumably remained around the area in some capacity. However, the city remained abandoned for about a hundred years. Corinth was only refounded by Julius Caesar during his time as dictator. The city once again became a prosperous port and it took up the reins of the Isthmian Games once again after that job had fallen to its neighbors such as Tinea. In 395, however, the city was once again overran and sacked by the Goths. There are other reports from earlier in the 4th century that Corinth had been sacked in some way or fashion by Christian monks who were horrified at the sin that took place in Corinth, a notorious port town with bars, brothels, and other places for pursuing fun. Perhaps these Christian monks were inspired by the classic 1988 film Tracks as they began to trash places where people could express themselves in a sexual manner. At any rate, though, Corinth by the end of the Roman Empire was more or less defunct, and it would kind of remain so until its refoundation in more modern times. But until next time, I'm Thersites the Historian. And when we next look at an ancient Greek city, we will be looking at Agina or Argos. If you want to learn about Boeotia and its four major cities, you should become a patron. And also, if you want to learn about Sparta, you should consider becoming a patron because that will be a series that will be a Patreon exclusive.